Thank you for that delightful introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'll try and speak loudly, some people. Um, there's an empty spot here, or two seats and one seat there. So anyone who has trouble hearing in the back, I invite you, now's a great time to come up and take one of these seats. Um, and I'll signal for the next slide. I do conduct research on meditation and contemplative spirituality at my laboratory at Naropa University. But today I'll be describing to you studies that other people have done studying human brains in general and also during meditation and mindfulness. And we'll be thinking together about how that can be leveraged for teaching in the classroom. The talk has four parts. First, the neuroscience. I'll offer a little bit of a reminder or a tutorial as to how the living cells in the human brain communicate with each other and do their work. Then I'll remind us, as you're already, perhaps many of you, how many of you have some kind of contemplative practice? Please raise your hand. Wow. Okay, and then with the other hand, how many people are educators in one way or another? Most everybody on both fronts. And maybe you're in only one of those camps, but, or friends of others. Um, so we'll um, see how mindfulness offers so many different ways to invite engagement with awareness. Then we'll put the two together to see your brain on mindfulness and meditation. <laughs> and then we'll draw from that principles that we can apply to various aspects of the learning that we're doing throughout our lives and the teaching and educating that many of us are involved in. So that's the plan. Are we up for that? Okay. So first, neuroscience. Let's see if I can do this rapid fire slides. Are we advancing? There we go. Okay. So we'll look at how brain cells, called neurons, communicate with each other. We'll see what that has to do with mind and conscious experience. Then I'm going to tell you something about what's been discovered in the last decade, a system in our brain that we default to. So it's this network of activation that is called the default mode network, which is important to understand our waking reality, our waking consciousness, our moods and so on and the impact that meditation has on brain activity. And then I'll share with you about neuroplasticity, which is how brains are always learning and changing and growing with experience. So here's our friend, the neuron. This is my little cartoon. Here's the cell body with dendrites that receive inputs. You don't need to memorize any of this, but just watch the cool animation. There's information that comes in, and let's see if we can get the hand signals down. <clears throat> information coming in, that activates a little bit. And then when signals come in together, that's enough for it to fire off all the way down to where it's connected. Let's see that again. <laughs> so one input at a time isn't quite enough. When multiple inputs come in, that can be enough to trigger sending down the long cable called the axon to a bunch of other neurons to which it's connected. So here's, um, go ahead, here's a um, circuit where there are a bunch of neurons interconnected with each other. Each, uh, this is a blue neuron, this is a green neuron, um, <laughs> here in the um, space between you and the lovely Rocky Mountains. This is the maroon bells actually in the background that um, we visited a few years ago. But these um, circuits show how neurons are never alone. A, a neuron is a cell whose job it is, is to communicate with other neurons. Just like a red blood cell has the job of taking oxygen from the lungs and bringing it to areas of the brain and other parts of the body that need that fuel, need that oxygen, lets go of the oxygen, goes back the heart and lungs and gets more oxygen. Just like bone cells um, are stiff and stable and strong, neurons have the job of communicating. Neurons are constantly in communication with each other 24-7. Whether you're awake or asleep, your brain and body 
suffused with the living nervous system, cells are always firing, always communicating with each other. So, of course, the circuit isn't that big. It's actually small enough to fit in your brain. And, in fact, um, there's not just one circuit. There are innumerable circuits um, in the brain, and they do work. Um, the neurons that are closely interconnected with each other are busy chewing on something, um, whether it's a thought about, gee, it's kind of warm in here, or whether it's uh, a feeling of an itch uh, on your ankle. Uh, we have lots of neurons, not just thousands, not millions or billions, but gazillions <laughs> of neurons. That's a technical term. Um, and they're, they're all busy communicating with each other. There's a hubbub going on all the time. How many of you have that experience where it feels like that on the inside of your nervous system? Okay. Well, it's true. The neuroscience shows us that. So here you can see the pulsing, perhaps, of these circuits uh, reflecting their activity. And we actually can map uh, activity in visual cortex to visual experience. When there are lots of functional brain imaging studies that show when people visually perceive stimuli that are presented to them or even imagine visual images or recall visual experience, there's activity in this part of the brain, in these circuits. In fact, when that part of the brain happens to die from a stroke or become completely compromised, then the person loses all visual experience. So there's a very tight one-to-one -one -to mapping between activity in these neural circuits within different parts of the brain and different domains of experience. Let's, let's see a few more. We have visual, auditory, somatosensory, bodily sensations, as well as anticipations, hopes, and fears in frontal cortex. This actually is a bit of a map of the cortex if you're going from the back toward the front. So when we think about our conscious experience, when we think about mind, how we process information, what our concerns us, what our minds are about, our brains are right there with us the whole time doing the work that subserves that mental life, that conscious experience. So neurons tend to communicate in ways that make pathways. So you may have heard the phrase neural pathways. I just wanted to show you that when there are some neurons interconnected in a way that feeds information forward, often that pathway is reciprocated by other neurons sending information back the other way. This is something that has been learned in the last 15, 20 years in neuroscience that is true for humans and lots of other mammals that uh, we have this bi-directional capacity for communication from one part of the brain to another through these neural pathways. Is that making sense so far? Yes. Okay. So here's a network of circuits we're starting to build, kind of like tinker toys. Uh, we have these different circuits that can be located in different parts of the brain. They don't have to be adjacent to each other as long as they have a number of axons that are sending their signals to neurons in another circuit. So uh, let's see this in action. Oh, um, yeah, um, I'm showing that later. So uh, you'll have to wait to see how um, these things move about when they're in communication with each other. But trust me, they're doing this all the time. Let's proceed. So I'm showing you what came out a decade ago in a publication by Grecius et al. Uh, in the Cerebral Cortex Journal about what brains are doing when the person's not doing anything. So often, most functional brain imaging studies over the recent decades have focused on task performance. When someone is reading or someone is thinking or someone is imagining 
and comparing different conditions. Well, what has always served as the baseline for comparison is rest or <coughs> not doing anything. And finally, it occurred to neuroscientists to take a look. Well, wait a minute. What, what are brains doing when they're not doing anything? And it turns out that our brains are up to something, <laughs> that we have areas of the brain in uh, posterior cingulate cortex and other uh, areas of the brain that I could name but might be meaningless to you that are functioning together. They're communicating with each other. They, they must, of course, have some neural pathways that connect these different areas that are active while we're not doing anything. In terms of what that's like for people, in terms of the actual psychology of it, it turns out that most of us, when we're not doing anything, we're, our minds are wandering. It's like daydreaming. We might kind of drift from one thing to another, and we might not be paying much attention. We may not even remember where our mind wandered. We might just say, whoa, I wasn't here. I was gone for some period of time. I'm not sure how long. <coughs> So this mind-wandering activity uh, has been linked with this pattern of activation in the brain. So it's been called the default mode network. That by default, our brains go there. Along with our minds, by default, wandering. Now, wandering sounds great. There's this bumper sticker, all who wander are not lost. Well. It turns out there have been a number of studies in the last five years especially about mind wandering and it has been linked with depression and rumination and anxiety and unhappiness, lack of well-being. turns out when our minds wander to a, a large extent, when it happens a lot, we um, are not making ourselves happy. Quite the contrary. We're um, finding um, difficult spots that we wander through and it's troublesome. And we're focusing on ourselves a lot. There's um, a great uh, meditation teaching. If you want to be unhappy, think of yourself. If you want to be happy, think of others. It turns out that scientific studies of the mind back that up. That uh, when we engage in self-focused rumination, thinking, we become consternated and it makes us unhappy. That's the top panel shows that pattern of brain activation. The bottom panel shows through a relatively new imaging methodology the fiber tracts, the axons, that connect circuits in one part of the brain with other circuits that make part of this network. And this paper, published a decade ago, shows that there is a close coupling between the fiber tracts. These are in living human brains. They were not opened up and dissected. This is with um, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, to show the, the tractography, the measurement of where these axons are. And there's a close correspondence between the parts of the brain that are physically connected through these axons and the default mode network that is activated through those connections. So the science has worked this out uh, rather convincingly. How did that go over? Did that make sense? So f some questions? Any, any question that you can put your finger on? Yeah. What type of imaging was the bottom again? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you named it. Um, yes. It's um, diffusion tractography imagery. <laughs> and it's a, a very advanced method that allows um, the orientation of white matter, myelinated axons, to be visualized in three dimensions. Yeah. And so the bottom panel, just to be clear, is um, the 
axons that have been demonstrated to connect these different areas, and they correspond to what's been observed over time as to which areas are active when the person in the scanner is not doing anything. I should say that these data originate with a method called fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imagery, functional MRI, so not just looking at um, the anatomy, the structural image of the brain as presented by regular MRI, but functional MRI shows where blood flow is coming in to provide nutrients like oxygen to the tissue that houses all of these neural circuits that have been very active. Turns out that within four seconds of a part of the brain being activated and the neurons communicating more with each other, the vascular system responds and blood flow increases to that little patch of tissue within four seconds. It's remarkable that that's just normal human physiology. That allows this imaging methodology to work. So I'm, I'm thankful that it happens to work that way. Yeah? What two parts of the brain are connected there? Right. And, and is, this, is this when we're doing nothing? And yes, that's right. This is um, one image. Uh, you'll see a few of the default mode network. So um, here we have um, an area in the frontal lobe of cortex. This is the front. This is the back. Uh, and so this is an internal area, rather medial, toward this midline, not toward the outside, called um, posterior cingulate cortex. Mm -hmm. You'll notice this white, matter, this white track here. That's the corpus callosum. That's the band of axons that connects the two cortical hemispheres. <coughs> All right, so let's advance. We'll see a, a few more images. Oh, but there's lots of questions. Okay, yeah, well, let's hear a few. Oh, well, Please. Um, it seems that this resting mind, in my experience, is also uh, about planning and kind of scanning what's going on in my life and uh, maybe creative thought. Um, it, it serves more of a purpose than, than just kind of being sad or depressed. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I did overstate the case as to um, all that the default mode network might get up to, but I would say um, that the brain is a very complex organ of experience and that what has been identified thus far only in the last 10 years as this default mode network overlaps with a number of other functional networks. So some of these same areas are recruited and involved in communicating with other areas of the brain, leading to a great variety of subjective experience. So though functional neuroscience has come a long way, from another point of view, we're really just now taking baby steps in terms of mapping the complexities of human experience that are very rich and some idiosyncratic and uh, interesting or difficult to compare between individuals. And this approach to neuroscience that seeks to see how people's brains in general are functioning. And so it's true the default mode network has been observed in individual participants, but it's never quite identical. It's always a bit more or less between different people. So the story I'm presenting to you today is um, a bit of a gloss. It's a little bit um, simplified, but it's also what, um, to some degree, we have the most confidence in from a neuroscience perspective. I take your point. Anything else before we have to? Let's move on to the next slide. OK. So. Um, one thing that I want to say about the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, that uh, by virtue of their innervation throughout the body of all of our organs and glands, that uh, it's by virtue of these systems that the brain is able to influence our state of bodily arousal. And it's the sympathetic system that tenses us up and uh, gets us ready for action. And the parasympathetic system is about relaxation. So I can present you these as the tensing system and the relaxing system that 
uh, can counterbalance each other. And the brain, <clears throat> time to relax for a moment. The brain tends to go toward one of these or the other. And of course, in our speedy, stressful lives, we spend a whole lot of time, many of us, in sympathetic arousal states uh, that can lead to ulcers. That um, we're uh, on edge um, even when we're just checking our email or responding to a particular email or having a meeting. All of these things can, depending on our attitude and experience, be stressful. So wouldn't it be nice to find ways to be able to negotiate or navigate that in order to strike a healthy balance between these tensing and relaxing systems? Ah, here's, remember this, uh, that we have these different circuits in a network and you, now you've seen an image of a brain and uh, be able to situate them, but I like presenting them to you in front of the maroon bells. Let's um, see how attention can influence. When information comes in, uh, the axons are firing and the receiving neurons get that information and send it out from other neurons and some of that gets fed back along a pathway. So you have the white arrows in the feed forward and the green arrows in the feed back and you get this kind of resonant activity within a network that can be rather coherent. And the, the boost that comes from attention is something that has been measured in laboratories across the world for decades, both in terms of observable behavior, how people are able to efficiently process information that's presented to them, as well as at the cellular level, as well as with human subjects looking at brain electrical activity on the, measured on the scalp or volumetrically in the brain, the interior of the brain, as measured through fMRI. So the notion of paying attention, which is common parlance, we all try and pay attention sometimes or hope that our students are, and it turns out that attention involves very discernible functions that are brain-based and have uh, been studied. So here's again our friend the neuron with the um, illuminated portions in this cartoon image representing synapses, the areas where one neuron firing out along its axon connects with the next neuron. So this is only showing a few of these synaptic connections, but on average, a neuron communicates in the human brain with 10,000 other neurons. So there's high degree of interconnectivity. <clears throat> it turns out, and this has been known now for a good 15 years at least, that human brains not only develop and grow and change their functional capacities during childhood, but that ability to respond to experience and become different as a brain, changing, continues throughout human adulthood. So this aspect, this flexibility, this uh, capacity for change that our brains have is called neuroplasticity. And if you haven't heard of that before, I would keep an eye out for it. Neuroplasticity is this fundamental attribute of the human brain that allows it to learn from experience. One way that neuroplasticity can happen is that the strength of connection of certain synapses can change. It can be dialed up or dialed down and that way a neuron can start to change what influences it. It can listen more intently, strengthen the inputs of signals that matter to it more and can tune out signals that just seem to be random noise. So 
the way the brain is operating in this way is that it tends to dial up the sensitivity to inputs that are coherent, that have something to do with one another, that make sense, that are resonant. And it tends to dial down or inhibit or weaken the synaptic inputs from neurons that are just sort of giving miscellaneous random inputs that aren't really making sense with the other inputs coming in from thousands of other neurons. So that's one of the cellular and subcellular mechanisms of neuroplasticity. The take home there is that every moment of experience changes your brain. It's happening right now. You can't help it. Which is both empowering and somewhat humbling. Whatever we spend our time doing, our brains are becoming more adept, more skilled, more tuned to doing that. So um, when I spend a lot of time you know, watching TV, I'm training my brain to do that. When I'm engaging in my contemplative practice of Tai Chi or sitting meditation, I'm training my brain to do that. All experience counts from the point of view of where the brain is headed in your life, how neuroplasticity is causing it to draw from, learn, take home, and start to embody and incorporate the experience that is ongoing. Okay, so now I'd like to review this rapid-fire uh, excursion through neuroscience. We talked about how brain cells communicate with each other. That's what they're about. We've noted the correspondence between conscious experience and even unconscious mind events and brain activity. And I've introduced, perhaps, introduced you to the default mode network, which If I wait long enough, it'll be what your brain is doing. <laughs> it's just, it's a natural thing that happens. We just, our minds go there. And then I've introduced you to neuroplasticity, which I hope is, is good news for you. Let's proceed. So that's the neuroscience part of the talk. We're doing okay. Next comes mindfulness, which has been handed down to us from thousands of years of practice and teaching. And uh, Let's find, here's my sense of what mindfulness is about. There are lots of different definitions. Inviting present moment awareness and staying with or abiding in present moment awareness of whatever occurs. So if we were to take stock right now of what's happening, each of us, in our experience, when I'm speaking, you hear sounds. But you might hear sounds even when I'm not speaking, if you pay close attention. And of course, there's bodily sensations and visual sensations, all the sense modalities as well as everything else that's happening in your mind. So I want to point out that it's by virtue of attention that we become mindful. We engage with awareness by inclining our minds in that direction. So. What is attention? It's the way we focus more on something that's available in our mind, usually at the expense of minimizing other content. I'll point out that we can do this with a kind of stern harshness rather fiercely, or to the contrary, we can adapt, uh, adopt a manner of attending that's a bit more of a light touch, that can be rather gentle 
a sort of friendly invitation into awareness. So there's a lot of different ways that attention can operate and the meditation literature that's hundreds and thousands of years old offers a rich description of many of these ways, <clears throat> though they have yet to be investigated scientifically. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank you. I've actually done some laboratory study of attention over the years, and I'm now interested in bringing that standard investigation in Western psychological science to bear on contemplative varieties of attending. So you can stay tuned for that in a future talk, perhaps. Let's proceed. So let's take a quick tour from a first-person point of view, that is, subjectively, from the inside of your living nervous system that has all these neurons communicating with it in your body. You happen to reside in the interior of that, and there's some quality of what that's like in each moment of your experience. So let's start with the senses. You can simply do a global survey and just see what the highlights are that come up, or you can focus in. For example, just to demonstrate, I ask you to focus on the toes in your left foot. If you can direct attention to the front of your left foot and see what sensations are there, Arguably, those sensations were there already, and it's simply by virtue of your moving your attention to focus on them that they enter conscious awareness. Indeed, uh, from a neuroscience perspective, you can trace the activity of receptor cells in your toes that then have axons that communicate with other neurons that uh, convey this kind of information into different bodily uh, focused parts of the brain, somatosensory cortex, for example. And it's a tension that allows us to access these various patterns of activity that are happening mostly in the cortex. I'll admit, <clears throat> when it comes to neuroscience, to being something of a cortical chauvinist. <laughs> because I care so much about conscious experience, I'm much more interested in the anatomy and function and understanding the interrelationships of areas within cortex, the outermost covering of the brain, because that's where the action is in terms of conscious experience, perhaps exclusively. So um, I'll admit that bias to you right now. Let's move to thoughts. This might be the first time you succeed in having no thought. But can you catch a thought as it arises, or sustains, or decays? Even a thought about thoughts can count. So mindfulness of mind can include noticing thoughts. That's part of experience. One of the strengths of mindfulness practice is that nothing is excluded. Whatever it is that arises in experience is fair game for noticing and simply being with, letting it be as it is. So too with emotional feelings. Those are a little bit harder to conjure up or click into, but if you were to peel a layer or two of the onion, you might dig down and find there's a sense of feeling calm and centered or feeling slightly uneasy, disquiet, or perhaps some stronger feeling that's more self-evident. 
I want to add to these the notion of interpersonal mindfulness, that we as educators care deeply about other people. So at this moment, I'll invite you to recognize that you're sitting next to another human being who can themselves engage in mindful awareness in the same moment as you. Check it out. Right now, there are people who are aware of you as you are aware of them. And it doesn't really matter if you're looking at each other or not. You can simply share this interpersonal awareness by being present in the same moment together. And if you are able to extend that to people sitting next to you, you might even extend that further to people sitting a bit further along in the row. Can you do that? Can it feel like there's this mutually <clears throat> engaged awareness that you're sharing? How far can that go? Could it go throughout everyone in a room? <clears throat> Maybe so. So I offer that these are at least some domains in which mindfulness can use attention to engage with awareness. How was that for you? Does it make sense? What's your experience? Anyone? Um, how about if we just take a moment and share something genuine from your experience, if you're willing, with a neighbor? So if you could quickly, within your row or across rows, it doesn't really matter, just whoever kind of is available in twos or threes, let's just take a minute or two to see whether mindfulness of the senses or thoughts or feelings or people, whatever might be um, most salient for you, what's your experience of that? Is that okay to... Maybe you didn't sign up for this. Is this okay? <laughs> Go ahead and try it with, with a, a neighbor or two. Thank you. The life force in this group is strong. So we will have time for discussion later. So rather than asking for reports out or asking you to, to share more widely from your experience, let's use that as a foundation for now thinking about what brains are doing while people are being mindful. Um, oh, right. Well, so here's something about awareness. Um, I think of awareness as a living space in which connection can occur. And that's very much inspired by the neuroscience, where it's all about these anatomical connections between local circuits that allow for resonant communication across these broad networks within the brain. I feel like it's getting darker. <laughs> is that okay? Or is that not okay? I, don't, I, I think it needs to be a little lighter. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, so, next. Yeah. Um, right, before bringing in the brain, I want to point out that any of us might notice change from moment to moment or from one period of time to another, that we're in one state of mind wandering and then we're in a state of focused, sustained attention. 
we're in one state of having a pleasant conversation. We're in another state of freaking out in some way. Um, we, we go through different states of consciousness. And uh, sometimes we might have an experience, even if quite momentary, where a, a greater expanse of awareness flashes and we, we have that experience. As we practice meditation or whatever our contemplative practice might be, to the extent that it invites mindful engagement with awareness, then these states become more familiar, they happen more frequently, and when they may have at one time been rather intermittent, now they're happening at such a rate that we actually develop a trait of mindfulness. And there have been a number of studies uh, that have looked at this, both in terms of self-report measures of mindful attending, as well as brain electrophysiology measures. There's a paper published in 2006 by Kahn and Polich that um, has as its title, States and Traits, looking at electrophysiology of mindfulness. And um, that was a nice review that uh, pulled together these findings that showed this natural evolution that can happen with extended practice. Now, of course, we know that's by virtue of neuroplasticity. The more we have certain kinds of experience, the more our brains embody that and are naturally disposed to have more such experience. We've talked about neuroscience. We've talked about mindfulness. Now let's put them together. Here we have activity in a brain that's going all the time. Right now I can't tell whether this person's awake or asleep. Their neurons are firing. Their circuits are communicating. Let's cycle through. So we again see the conscious experience that now it looks like the person's awake and they have hopes and fears. When circuits are communicating in sort of a stilted manner with each other, they're not quite in sync. They, they don't resonate efficiently. And indeed, different parts of the brain can thank you, um, be poorly coordinated with each other and even working at odds. So often when we feel conflicted, it can literally be because different parts of our brain, different networks are trying to do different things at the same time that are incompatible. Whereas when neural circuits are firing in a smooth manner that can be coherent, and this can actually be measured on the scalp by virtue of the electrical signature produced each time a neuron fires, the, when a neuron sends a signal down its axon, that's an electrical event. And when Numerous, electron, uh, numerous neurons fire simultaneously, that produces a far field potential of a voltage change that can be measured in the electromagnetic field at a distance on the scalp of the head. So I just used a bunch of big words there to convince you I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what these neurons do. They're, they're um, in part electrical in their behavior. And that, again, is convenient for us when we want to try and measure things without putting electrodes all the way down into the person's brain, which can be rather invasive, and I don't suggest you try at home. But it's quite safe to put sensitive recording electrodes on the scalp, and um, by virtue of the fact that so many of the neurons in cortical tissue and other laminated structures within the brain are oriented parallel to each other, and they operate in some degree of synchrony, whereas we wouldn't be able to measure on the scalp, the activity of a single neuron, it's not that sensitive, we are able to measure the outputs of these local circuits that are communicating within a network because there's so many axons firing together. So um, if you look at the timing of these pulses, they're uh, a bit out of sync with each other. Whereas um, when there's more coherent efficient communication throughout the entire network, it becomes uh, more resonant in its appearance. Can you see that difference? Well, there have been studies showing that meditation, 
can influence, can increase the coherence measured on the scalp between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. This interhemispheric synchronization is measurable. And in the gamma band, very high frequency oscillations in the electromagnetic field produced by these neurons of um, more than 50 or 60 cycles per second is increased in meditators in two ways. One, you can see when the person's not meditating, each of these traces, by the way, is an individual person. So here's four people I'm showing you. Uh, the percent of gamma activity that's measurable on the scalp that is measurably synchronized between the left and right sides of the head uh, hovers around 8, 9, 10 percent. During meditation, <laughs> gamma increases in all four of these individuals, the gamma synchronization, that is, between left and right sides. So this is one of a handful of studies now that show quantifiably that the act of meditating, going from not meditating to meditating, can increase the coherent communication between the left and right sides of the brain. And the other half of the story is that in experienced meditators, this higher degree of resonant communication between the two sides of the brain isn't only discernible as a state effect comparing when they're not meditating and the same people when they're meditating. It also shows up at the baseline level. Non-meditators, on average, uh, have levels of gamma synchronization between the two sides that are below the chart. They're, they're <coughs> less than meditators. So meditator, meditation brings a state of synchronization between anatomically far networks left and right sides of the brain. And that evolves in experienced meditators to a trait of higher synchronization. Now, maybe we wouldn't be surprised by that because we know states evolve into traits. That's part of the lasting power of neuroplasticity. Well, it's certainly true for meditation's influence on the um, ability for different circuits, neural circuits within the brain to synchronize with each other. All right, so I want to remind you of this slide we've seen earlier about the default mode network uh, that can be seen in activation levels through the blood flow response that's measured by fMRI and how that maps onto the structural anatomy of fiber tracts, axons, connecting different circuits with each other. And sure enough, here's a recent study published a couple of years ago, December 2011, by Judd Brewer et al. out of Yale, that meditators show a deactivation in some parts of the default mode network. And here you see uh, meditators compared to controls. This was during a task of meditation, um, either an open awareness meditation or a loving kindness meditation, a few different kinds of meditation. Those are the different colored bars. And the experienced meditators knew what these things were and could do them, whereas the non-meditators were trying this for the first time. They had instructions to follow, but they weren't really familiar with using their minds and hearts in this way. So um, the blood oxygen level dependent response, that's a bold measure of fMRI showing how much of the blood is oxygenated. For the non-meditators, there was a boost in oxygenation of the tissue in the default mode network. So that is an indication that those neurons were firing more and needing more fuel. Whereas for the meditators, the default mode network became less active. Neurons firing less, requiring less blood supply. So, and, and that's true in, in, in different parts. This is different views of the same 
composite brain. This is not one individual. Um, this is a, a set of individuals. And um, this corresponds with the subjective report. So the novices, the controls, the non-meditators, trying this stuff and um, not feeling very successful with the technique. It's very hard often, the very first time one's presented with the technique of trying to do it. Uh, whereas the meditators um, were able to relax into that method of meditation, be it open awareness or loving kindness. And um, so there was this correspondence, again, between what it was like for each of those meditators from a first-person point of view, that is, from the inside, subjectively, what their experience was like, corresponding with what's measured from the outside, in this case, a third-person measurement of their blood flow throughout the volume of their brain. Yeah, if you want to put it that way, um, you could say that meditation was the task that was being investigated in this study. Uh, they were certainly in telling participants when to do it and when not to do it. So in that sense, participants were to follow instructions of that task. Does it matter what they meditate on? Uh, not too much. Um, the green bars is the open awareness meditation. Um, so um, in this sample, the deactivation was somewhat less for that method of meditation than for these other two. Um, but again, this is one study and it's relatively new. Uh, the same lab and now other labs are pursuing this line of investigation even further. So this is a very hot topic in research right now. Is there a question there? Well, you're um, pointing out that um, this study is limited in, in the con conditions that it chose to compare. And indeed, that critique applies to any study. So any one study, we really need to take with a grain of salt and see what it serves up and then see how that might compare to other studies that use slightly different methods and see whether we get convergence of results. So this is still early days. When I spoke about the field of functional neuroscience taking baby steps with regard to meditation. This is what I'm talking about. We need many more studies like this to see how those results may or may not converge. So um, the point about maybe the control subjects were uncomfortable and unfamiliar with that task, what would happen in the default mode network in a task in which they are more at ease and familiar and skilled is, is a very good question. And there, there's a host of such questions um, suffusing the field currently. Well, remember now, this default mode network is typically deactivated when people are doing a focused task other than just mind wandering. And yet, when presented with these so-called tasks of meditation, the novices, the controls, showed activation of the default mode network. So maybe you've had the experience as a beginning meditator when you sort of invite you know, some settling and some quiet, and you notice monkey mind. Notice a lot of thoughts happening, <laughs> rapid fire. Um, that corresponds, perhaps, with this higher level of activity in the default mode network, whereas with the skilled, experienced meditators, there was a deactivation. So um, that kind of deactivation can be seen during performance of tasks, um, that a whole variety of tasks that um, people are... Um, measured doing in these scanners. So uh, that's somewhat compelling evidence that um, the meditators and the non-meditators were responding differently to these task instructions and their brains were doing different things. Let's proceed. I see more questions, but we'll have, we'll have time for discussion. I want to get through a few more slides. So the medial prefrontal cortex 
uh, the insula and temporal lobes uh, in meditators showed more interconnectivity in terms of um, when these areas are active, second by second, compared to controls during meditators. So there are areas of the brain that, um, just as the default mode network during meditation is suppressed, it's less active, it's just kind of soothed, quieted down, other parts of the brain are coming online. So it's not as if meditation entails quietude throughout the brain. Some areas become less active, others become more active. And the project that I have committed to doing in February, March, and April at the Mind and Life Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, is to review all of this neuroscientific literature about what's occurring in brains during meditation compared to non-meditation and write that up for a publication as a review article. And um, that's because there's now this peppering of new findings coming out and there needs to be a synthesis that kind of puts them all on a big table together and makes sense of, well, what is, um, you know, the insula? Oh, okay, well, that's um, this nestled island of a part of cortex in temporal lobe that is involved in feeling, both emotional feeling tone and bodily sensations. So when you were attending to your left toes earlier in this talk, in addition to somatosensory cortex and other areas of your brain being activated, so too was your right insula. Uh, and so mapping out the precise, and not just the summarize, but I'm actually wanting to look at individual data and talk with these neuroscientists and get into the inside of those data sets to um, try and get a big picture uh, across the whole brain, not just the cortex as to um, what's happening during these different meditation practices. So um, stay tuned. If, if anyone who's interested in um, keeping up with that, just let me know, and I'm happy to put you on a mailing list. Let's proceed to the next. OK. Now we've got a football game coming up in just a couple of weeks, less than that. Um, who is it who's playing? <laughs> the Denver Broncos and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I'm a little worried because one of those teams, as a team, has engaged mindfulness practice as a training technique. And it's about a thousand miles west of here <laughs> that's doing that. So, uh, but nonetheless, um, let's try and take a look. Um, so, mindlessness is, notice the colors, <laughs> is brain networks that are working at odds with each other, at cross purposes not communicating coherently and efficiently, conflictual. Whereas mindfulness fosters greater coordin coordination that depends on the anatomical connectivity that's there. It's just the way that it gets used becomes more skillful, more synchronized. And this is what I'm hoping for both the offense and the defense of the Denver Broncos <laughs> next Sunday. Well, politics, um, maybe that will be the next, the next thing to tackle after football. Okay. Um, so my understanding of awareness is that the more that these different circuits and networks within the brain, the more they can go about their business in a way that's sensitive to what's going on in the other networks that they're interconnected with, that makes for a much more peaceful situation they can have a greater, more expansive vista from the inside of more of the totality of what's going on. And we can certainly see all of those different domains within the brain. And each of us has our own experience of what that's like on the inside. And not um, least or last, uh, another aspect of neuroplasticity that's quite profound is not simply that neurons and patches of neural tissue change the way that they're more sensitive to some inputs and less sensitive to others. That's the mechanism of neuroplasticity at work. But over time, it can lead to changes in the structural anatomy of the brain in that an area of cortex 
that you're training and using a lot becomes measurably thicker. Now, we don't know why, whether it's because there are more glial cells in that tissue supporting the activity of the neurons, whether more neurons are being generated and taking up space. A number of questions remain, but this structural kind of neuroplasticity has been observed in London taxi cab drivers in parietal cortex uh, for their years of training and knowing all the streets of London and what is the one-way street and where you need to turn left and all of those things. It's easier to turn left in London than it is in this area. They drive on the wrong side of the street there. Um, so um, when spatial processing and skill are emphasized, parietal cortex through neuroplasticity grows a thickening in the patch of tissue that's responsible for that function. And this has been found in violin players and lots of people, specialized populations who are trained and have thousands of hours of practice show these measurable effects on anatomy. Well, the same has been found for meditators. So meditation is no different than these other activities of mind in regard to neuroplasticity, that you do something enough and you can measurably see a thickening in the patch of cortical tissue that is responsible for that function. And that's been found even after only six weeks of Vipassana training. This first study that came out in 2005 by Sarah Lazar and others, um, Harvard, compared Vipassana meditators with non-meditators. This study was followed up a few years later comparing the same individuals longitudinally, following them before meditation and after six weeks of Vipassana meditation. And sure enough, even within such a short period, their insular cortex, this area that's involved in body scan, that's a big part of Vipassana training, showed this measurable thickening. So neuroplasticity can affect the microscopic cellular and subcellular level all the time and rather quickly, perhaps even in a matter of hours or minutes, whereas weeks of activity is enough to make this thickening kind of effect in the brain that's visible from these structural scans. What's the function of the insula? Right. The insula, as I mentioned before, has to do with um, feeling tone uh, with an emotional load as, as well as bodily sensations. So the insula um, has been shown quite clearly to be involved in those activities. Yeah. So we've addressed the first three. Now let's see what principles we can derive from the neuroscience of mindfulness to apply in our work as educators. Number one, Trust your brain. Trust the brains of your students. Um, this allows you to relax. You know all this neuroplasticity is going on. And when you relax, you're less at odds with yourself. You're kind of getting out of the way. You don't have to be in a tight, controlling stance toward your mental self-governance. You can trust that things can happen the way they need to. And that opens up. Uh, access to your vast storehouse of mental capacities. And by relaxing and allowing yourself to be authentic, you model that for your students, which is very important. There's the notion of being on edge and um, tense and maybe tentative versus feeling at home, feeling relaxed. Uh, being able to um, effortlessly engage. And that mode of being is delightful when we experience it. And to the extent we can mix that into our work as educators, it becomes a true gift for those we work with. Just as the brain is the organ of experience, so too um, experience is the medium in which all learning occurs. 
if you look at definitions of learning, there, there is none without experience. So mindfulness is all about using attention to become more sensitive and be able to notice more of the experience that's already happening without needing to change it. A big rub for a lot of teachers is I can't have one more thing to do. I, I, don't, I don't have time for that and I've already been loaded with way too many things to do. Rather than being one more thing to do, mindfulness offers a different way to be that encourages us in the, this healthy way to be able to relax with our experience, whatever it is. We, we might even develop a degree of equanimity where whether it's some tension or some uncertainty or some feeling angry, um, we can have a spacious enough stance toward our experience that accommodates these variations without needing to uh, boil over or, or get carried away. We can keep our seed while these different, sometimes strong emotions are occurring. And that really allows us to stay available for um, those that we're sharing the educational experience with. I've seen mindful classrooms. And there's a vibrancy, um, a life force of the kind that we experienced earlier when you were talking with your neighbors. And learning is just splashing off the walls. People are awake and paying attention and interesting and things are happening. With mindfulness, uh, boredom is a rarity. Uh, and even boredom can be kind of interesting. It's like, oh, the boredom is happening. Oh, let's look at that. <laughs> Maybe you're experiencing a lot of that tonight. Um, and I think it really helps people to connect with each other through often a very implicit interpersonal mindfulness. It's great to share an experience with someone. But you can actually direct, as I did with you earlier this evening, explicitly, consciously, intentionally to share awareness with others. There's a number of ways in which that can be orchestrated. Next. <laughs> Not sure what that is. Whoa. <laughs> OK. Um, so the other day, I um, forgot my car keys from Naropa. And I was kind of in a hurry. And so I was walking back to the building from the parking lot to get my keys. And I realized, oh, I'm in a hurry. I'm, uh, my mental state is rather speedy right now. Why don't I take this as an opportunity to slow down and walk mindfully back to the building to get my car keys? And so now this has become a practice for me. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but I get plenty of opportunity. Um, when I uh, have left a room or a building or something um, and forgotten something and I'm coming back for it, now that's a cue to remind me to, oh, let's take this as a, a practice moment, even though I'm not sitting on a cushion, to actually just slow down and invite greater awareness to my experience as it happens. And that's an example where any time we feel um, off in some way, we, we can invite noticing that and let that be a wake-up call. I encourage you to try this. You can pick one thing. I've given you my example. You can, you're welcome to use that, or you might encounter your own. Um, but this doesn't have to be resorted to only during a formal practice session. This could be something that is alive for you in, in any context, <coughs> where what for you becomes sort of an obstacle, or you get derailed, or maybe it's some function of the default mode network. Who knows? Um, you can cultivate an intention, plant a seed for that. When that happens, you can more and more frequently become aware of that and then let, let that become a pivot point of choice where in that moment you can proceed as you want to. Maybe 
I want to be in a hurry because I don't want to be late for something. Fine. But at least it can be intentional on your, per, your part rather than proceeding in an automatic fashion. That so much, for many of us, so much of our lives are lived on autopilot in this automatic way. And mindfulness, by virtue of noticing, attending to experience, inviting greater awareness, opens up this set of opportunities where we get to choose a little bit more how we want to be living those next moments. Okay, so perhaps oversimplified, but um, the default for a lot of people, as has been measured by psychologists, is focusing on oneself, my needs, the, what I need to get done, um, that d doesn't seem to be leading to very much happiness. And in any present moment, once we notice, oh, this is a present moment happening right now, we can use that to pivot into whatever way of being we find available. And brains help us do that. They keep changing. The neuroplasticity is happening, happening all the time. It never stops. So now I ask you, what situations do you think might benefit from this kind of approach of helping you or those you work with be more mindful? And how might you use any of this in your teaching or learning? So um, at this point, we have um, some time for discussion. We'll end um, before 9, uh, I think maybe 8.45, so that there'll be time to mingle, because there's all kinds of interesting people in the room. I'm dying to meet those of you I haven't met yet, and I, th I think conferring with each other would be fantastic. Um, I encourage you to, to stay for that. But that gives us another 15 minutes to um, get some real-life examples from your situation, uh, in your, the learning or teaching that you do, and how um, you might have something that might seem impossible, or you just don't see the connection. And you could share that scenario, and we could look at that together and see, oh, well, here's an approach that might be applicable. Shall we try that? So, Peter, I'm, I'm working with a group of uh, pre-service teachers right now, so they were in teacher training, that um, did not necessarily self-select into this mindfulness training. Um, but they're coming along. There's a lot of so this is a cohort that is receiving mindfulness training as part of their training. They are, yes. <clears throat> We're struggling with carving out time for them to do formal meditation. Okay. And I'm wondering what your thinking is on, when you talk about you know, being aware and you forgot your keys and you walk back, I, I would consider that sort of an informal mindfulness practice, right? It's the, the formal being I'm sitting, I'm meditating, I'm doing a formal practice now. What are your thoughts on the benefits of an informal practice not supported, though, by a formal practice? Good. So for those who may not have heard, the question pertains to, on the one hand, formal practices like a set of Tai Chi movements or sitting meditation or whatever it might be versus meditation in everyday life where we might engage in it right now or I might engage in it when I forget my keys. And I would say that 5, 10, 15 minutes a day of formal practice gives us many moments where we're exercising the muscles of mindfulness, where we may drift off, we may want, our mind wanders, but then we notice and come back. Every time we notice and come back, we're exercising a muscle. It's like going to the gym. It's a rather specialized practice. We might even stay and abide in the present moment for a number of seconds. Wow, okay, so we're exercising that muscle of staying. So these muscles of coming back and staying get exercised quite rigorously during a formal practice of even a few minutes duration. And we can tell that because, you know, um, sometimes it, we get tired or it seems difficult or, you know, there's a challenge to doing this. It's work. Relaxing 
so profoundly is something we're not used to. We have to um, find ways to get used to it. If we're only doing the meditation in everyday life or the mindfulness off the cushion, we'll, be, we'll have moments and it, it will be helpful. Um, we can find opportunities to relax throughout our day and evening. It doesn't have to only be during a, a reserved time period and that's quite valuable. But in order to train our brain, what I think is essential is the more time, the more moments of experience in which we're using our brains in this way. And so formal practice of even short periods, I encourage, less than 10 minutes, is a way to get a daily dose of configuring the processing of these neural circuits in a coherent fashion that makes more likely the spontaneous occurrence of mindful states during the rest of the day. So without the foundation of even a brief formal practice most every day, um, the brain will engage in neuroplasticity at a slower pace in terms of learning and embodying this broader awareness. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about possible benefits and harms of using neural descriptions of meditation in the process of teaching meditation. So the question pertains to ethical dimensions of describing brain activity associated with meditation in the context of teaching meditation and perhaps also practicing meditation. I think it's um, at a minimum a matter of taste where some people are drawn to this sort of thing. I think there's a lot of interest uh, in this vicinity. But other people are repelled, and from my point of view, rightfully so. If, if that's not something that's meaningful or they care about in this way that might support their practice, then I wouldn't push this on anybody. I think it's really a matter of individual taste. I have heard from a number of meditators who've meditated for decades. When all of this science of meditation started to come out, they say, oh, well, that confirms from a scientific way of knowing that what I'm doing really works. And I kind of, I knew that already from my own personal experience, but it's confirming to hear it from other sources. So for some people, it, it adds something. Uh, but I would say for the vast majority of meditators, perhaps it doesn't make a hill of beans worth a difference one way or another. I mean, why would it? Um, on the other hand, having an understanding of how our brains work, and being able to use that as a basis for understanding some aspects of mind, and having a bigger picture and being able maybe to image somewhat concretely different patterns of activity, who knows? Maybe it could be harmful in some ways. Maybe it could be helpful in some ways. These are unanswered, unaddressed questions. OK, lots of uh, questions, please. hundreds of kids at this stage of the game, and I was explaining to her, one of our first practices we do is building neurons and pipe cleaners. And these are nine-year-olds. I think that the science is imperative to create embodiment. Um, and I also think that it's sort of ridiculous that we have health class, but we don't learn about our brain function. You graduate college and not really understand what your prefrontal <laughs> cortex is. <laughs> so I think that it actually should be necessary, but I'm wondering if you can talk about the role that those two particular areas of the brain play and how they react to mindfulness. Was there a particular area of prefrontal cortex that you're interested in? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just getting the connection, right, with how the amygdala and the PFC work together and how they can cut each other off. Right, right, okay. So um, the amygdala is an almond-shaped and sized nucleus uh, inside the rolls of the temporal lobe of cortex, but it's not actually a cortical structure. And it has five subnuclei. 
um, all of which are involved in the processing of emotion, in particular fear and uh, uh, being on the edge of your seat. And in fact, that can be a basis when it takes over and its influence dominates the cortex in the brain, you become emotionally hijacked. Um, whereas some areas of prefrontal cortex, um, including dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, can um, uh, operate in a very different mode where rather than the subcortical structure just freaking us out and um, we're in panic, uh, having a sort of calm, cool, collected uh, approach. And so coarsely speaking, um, those two parts of the brain can uh, be thought of as in tension and opposed to one another and that one uh, might be dominating or, or the other and they, they can either be keeping each other in check in high fidelity, and if, um, you know, there's a mudslide approaching, then that very rapid, very strong activation of the whole system from the amygdala could keep us alive. I mean, it's not a bad thing. But to have the amygdala flaring up, you know, every few minutes um, just because um, we're walking down a street or checking our email, uh, that's a bit much and pretty unhealthy. So uh, does this speak to some of what you're interested in in terms of meditation training um, gives us the tools to uh, navigate situations without always automatically following whatever our habitual pattern is in the amygdala for some of us just flaring up and, and getting out of hand left and right, uh, but rather to um, tame its function a little bit by activation of other areas of the brain to um, let it come in a bit more when it's most needed and, and not all the time. And it's true that maybe as meditation has come to Western societies through Hinduism and Buddhism and contemplative Judaism and Christianity and uh, Islam and all these different religious traditions and yoga and now meditation and mindfulness training is in many secular contexts, apart from any religious or spiritual tradition at um, YMCA's and, and different places, um, the local rec center and so on, um, that wider circles within the larger society are developing interest or trying it. And in terms of buy-in for people who haven't yet connected or found it to be uh, a viable thing to do, we live in an era of scientism. Science is held up on such a pedestal that if science as a way of knowing says, ha, this is really working, then the buy-in is incredible. There's so many people who say, oh, well, gosh, maybe it's real. I, I should check it out. So um, culturally, uh, science has a role to play. So um, I'll try and call on people who I haven't called on yet. Yes? I'm curious uh, why you and your colleagues, in your estimation, you have to make a very concise summary, I'm sure, are studying this. What is their motivation? Do they want to heal people? Do they want to validate their own religious experience? Do they get my drink? Yeah. Well, in my family, I'm a third generation scientist. And my dad was a, a plant uh, botanist and cellular biologist and so on. And he said, son, if you know a little biology and a little geology, you'll never be bored. <laughs> and um, I would add to that psychology and neuroscience and the rest, um, but it's, it's fun. Uh, I, I love science as a way of knowing. I don't use it exclusively. I uh, incorporate other ways of knowing in my life, but as a career, it's delightful to make discoveries of things that may be known in other ways or not, but they, they haven't been known scientifically before. And it's um, an amazing privilege to be part of that community of practitioners. Science is a human endeavor. It's a community of practitioners. And 
it's stimulating. It, it provokes uh, questions and contemplations uh, that otherwise uh, would be harder to come by. So there's a satisfaction at that level, a sort of personal um, egoic satisfaction. Uh, but there's also the aspiration to be of benefit, that uh, some of this work might actually be beneficial or useful to people. In fact, that's why I'm here speaking to you, thinking that knowing some of this stuff is going to be stimulating and um, encouraging for you as educators. And so I know I didn't offer necessarily um, a set of tips or tricks to try in the classroom, but what I'm hoping to do is motivate you to reflect from this perspective that's been offered this evening to examine your own life, your own educational enterprise, and reflect on that and dare to innovate. Be creative. If you're coming from a place of, of trust and authenticity and some knowledge about what brains are capable of, there's no limit to where you can take this and how mindful awareness can uh, perhaps infuse and benefit your work. So those are some of my motivations. And when I have conversations with others in the field, often there's great overlap. Yeah. And, Right. <laughs> University of Chicago's Mahalia Chixit Mahalia uh, wrote the book on flow and uh, other works as well. He's a psychologist who um, found that um, when the demands of whatever activity or task you're engaged in match pretty well your level of arousal and resources that you have to bring to bear, there's this ease. In um, athletes, it might be a state of grace. Uh, and that that's pretty cool and worth knowing about and aiming for or cultivating and enjoying. And so that has held up. That work um, from that perspective um, has um, been quite inspiring uh, to me and others. And I think it's just a, a bit of an older and different methods of uh, approach to some of the same territory that is uh, at play in the meditation and mindfulness exercises and uh, the brain's involvement. Um, I would say that um, there's been less neuroscientific study of flow than there has of meditation or mindfulness, so questions remain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalia Chiksent Mahai. Well, and I see more questions, but I see it's also gone quarter up. So um, I'll be around for a while, and I'm happy to connect with you. Um, can we advance the next slide? Um, so um, I would just like to thank the educators with contemplative practice for this opportunity to speak with you this evening. I believe it's recess. Yes. <laughs>